Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Mansfield. I'm a senior software engineer on the EV Cache team at Netflix. And I'm here to talk to you about the hidden microservice. Uh, it's our nickname for the caching layer. Um, to be clear, before I start, this has nothing to do with the Open Connect uh, CDN, which some people also refer to as a cache. That's a really cool, interesting, deep concept all on its own. Uh, it's not what we're talking about. This is just the Amazon Web Services cloud caching layer. So you just signed up for Netflix. Good decision. Uh, you get home. At the end of the day, you turn on your TV. You open the Netflix app. You need to sign in with your brand new account. You choose your profile. And naturally, your name is Tester, like everybody else. Um, it asks you to pick a few titles that you've liked before, or maybe ones that you've seen. So you pick a few, keep going. It tells you it's personalizing your experience for you. So it's building a brand new home page just for you. And there you are. You get there. You have House of Cards, Making a Murderer, which is a fantastic documentary. You could do a search for Tom Hanks, watch Forrest Gump for the millionth time. Uh, but you settle on Narcos. Um, this says season two coming September 2nd. It's already out in case anybody is excited about that show. Um, you can go watch season two. You're watching the first episode. You get to the part where he tells the guard, me llamo Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria, and he tells him, plata o plomo. And you're so impressed by this line, you need to go rate this show five stars. And you've even been showing all of your friends all the favorite parts of all of your episodes. And we're keeping track. So any guesses on how long we have to capture your attention before you go off and do something else? Guesses? Five. OK, okay a little bit short. Um, it's about 90 seconds. So the faster, the smoother, the better the experience that you have, the more likely we are to keep your attention and keep you watching Netflix. And part of the way we do that is by caching things on the server side. So let's take a look in that experience that you just saw, what things caches touch. There's signing up, logging in, choosing a profile, picking like videos, the personalization process, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail later, loading the home page itself, scrolling through the home page, any A-B test allocations that might be on your profile, and even the video image selection, the box art that you're seeing. And there's a whole mess of other things even beyond that. And if you look, there's a bunch of these have multiple caches involved in the back end. Put another way, this is what a typical home page request looks like. This is the output from our request tracing system. So the request comes in from the left side and goes all the way down to the right. If you look at those leaf nodes on the right, there's maybe half a dozen that are not an EV cache node. So I've talked about it, mentioned it. Let's talk a little bit about EV cache. It stands for ephemeral volatile cache. It's a key value store that we run that's optimized for running on Amazon Web Services and tuned for Netflix-specific use cases. It's a distributed, sharded, and replicated store. And that replication is tunable both within a single region and across multiple different regions. It's based on memcached, highly resilient to failure uh, because AWS is a highly dynamic environment. One of my colleagues actually called AWS uh, chaos monkey as a service, <laughs> which is pretty accurate. All credit to him for that, but um, they actually kill more of our instances than the Chaos Monkey does. <laughs> it's topology aware, network topology aware for faster access. It's linearly scalable. We can scale out the server side as much as we need to to handle the traffic, and it has seamless deployments for our internal customers. So why do we want to optimize for AWS? Uh, like I said, it's highly dynamic, but what does that mean? Well, instances can up and disappear at any time. Zones can fail. Entire regions can become unstable for any one of a variety of reasons. The network itself is lossy. And customer requests can actually bounce between multiple different regions of the same session. And the simple fact of life is that failures happen. 
and we have to be ready for them, and we test them all the time so that we are ready. So I'll give you a sense of scale for EV cache use at Netflix. We hold hundreds of terabytes of data in cache. We do trillions of operations per day, hold tens of billions of items, do millions of operations per second, millions of cross-region replications per second between two different regions, which we'll look at in more detail later. We have thousands of servers. It's more than 10,000, but not quite enough to call it like tens of thousands. We have hundreds of instances per cluster, up to hundreds. Hundreds of service clients that are potentially connecting to a single cluster. We have tens of distinct clusters for different use cases. They're tuned differently or have different setups. We operate across three regions, and we do this with four engineers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at just like a single app box and a single server box, how they talk to each other, or just what the setup looks like. There's an application running on our cloud somewhere. The likely path is that they're consuming somebody else's service client. That library would then consume our EV cache client library. And this is a Java client library. It's a jar that we vend. The server side has memcached, or what looks like memcached, and Prana, which is a sidecar. It's written in Java. It's used for people who are running applications that are not based on Java. It hooks into the rest of the Netflix ecosystem so we can report metrics and, and register with our service discovery system. The client talks directly to memcached. There's a TCP connection between the two. The sidecar will register with our service discovery, and the client can pull that information in order to find the server. So, one client with a whole EV cache cluster here. If you look, there's three different availability zones, and there's this dotted line around these boxes. That's a whole copy of data. So in this picture, we have three whole copies of data, one per availability zone. And the client has a connection to all of these separately. If we have many clients, all the clients have a connection to all the boxes. So this forms what's called a complete bipartite graph. So all clients connected to all servers, no clients connected to each other, and no servers are actually talking to each other. So for reading, relatively simple. We try the closest one first. And there's a couple backup paths in case that one doesn't work out, if it's a brand new instance, if it just died, or it's having network problems, or any one of a number of failures that can happen. Um, we can try a different node. Writing is a little bit more interesting. Uh, the client writes to all three. And that's how we have multiple different copies. All clients would be writing to all the different places that they need to write data. So we're going to take a look at a few different use cases, going from simple to complex. This one's fairly straightforward. It's a pretty common use case. So if you have a relatively slow service and a relatively fast cache, you can try the cache first and look in the service later. So if the application requests some data from the client library here, we try EV cache client first. And if it's not there, we can go to the service, which will go to its database, typically Cassandra for us. And then the service itself is responsible for writing back into the cache before or asynchronously as it returns the data. The second one, a transient data store. So think things like uh, your playback session as it's going on. We want to keep track of how you're doing. And over time, we have multiple different applications talk to the cache. So you might have one start up your session, another one update your session, then do a session roll up at the very end. If you notice, there's no database in this picture. It's just the cache there. This is a lot more interesting to me. Uh, this is our largest footprint, really, of caches. Uh, it's actually the primary storage mechanism for data. So we have these really large-scale pre-compute systems that run overnight every day to compute a brand new home page for every profile of every user. It's quite a lot of computation, and it's quite a lot of data. And what they do is they just write it into an EV cache cluster. And the online services are reading from this, not worrying about what time anything was written. Uh, we have a pretty strong culture of fallbacks. So we don't have to worry so much about data not quite being there all the time. So the whole picture looks like this. We have a set of offline services writing into the cache, a set of online services reading, and the cache acts as this buffer between the two, 
or a gateway or many other words you could use for it. Um, so this is our personalization data. This is even more interesting. We have some things that are very high volume and also need to be very high availability. So think UI strings, where if you don't have them, the user experience is pretty bad because it has no words on it. Um, they would have an in-memory cache. And then if that doesn't have the data, or they could do a background refresh from EV cache, uh, if it doesn't have the data, they could reach out to EV cache. If it does, if it, uh, does they could do a background refresh. Um, so think about whenever we're going into our peak during the day, we need to scale up some servers, and they all want to get this data. They'll be pulling it from EV cache. And there's another process that is asynchronously computing the latest package and publishing it to the cache. And beyond that, they could even go further and have a service that owns this data with a database behind it. But most people have actually found this to be optional because the uptime of the EV cache clusters is so good that they don't worry about it. So we've been looking at maybe 10,000 feet. Let's take a step back. Let's go to 30, 50 and take a look at what I call pipeline of personalization. So when you compute a new home page, it's not just one step. There's many different steps involved with different algorithms doing different things. You would have one, say, just compute A, publishing into an EV cache cluster. Its data sources are something that we're not involved with, maybe offline Hive or other data sources. And then maybe a compute B. You might have a C that depends on these two, and a D, and maybe an E. And this forms a DAG of data dependencies for our personalization process. All of this happens offline. And online services don't just pull the last output. They might pick and choose from different parts of this in order to provide the experience that they need. So online one, pull from A through D, and online two could pull from a different set. So the polyglot story at Netflix is an interesting one. It's a point of discussion right now, even. Um, but our team, as a somewhat central service, has decided to go ahead and solve this in our own way. Uh, our old world, or current world, really, is a Java app and our Java client. It's pretty straightforward. It's what you've already seen. But other people actually run our Prana sidecar as well. So we have an HTTP, like a REST API, that runs on box that people can use to access the cache. And we've made that remote as well. So we have a remote HTTP API, and even an experimental memcached protocol API that we've been working on uh, with a couple of our partner teams internally. Um, this is still an area of active development for us, so I don't really have any more detail on it right now. If you want to know more, you can talk to me uh, at the booth upstairs afterwards. There's some extra things on top of all the things that I've shown you so far that make the product work at Netflix scale. The main one is our cross-region global replication. We also do cache warming for faster deployments. We have secondary indexing for point queries for debugging. And we have a consistency checker that provides metrics on how consistent the caches are. Now, all of this is powered by mutation metadata flowing through a Kafka cluster. So we'll take a look at replication and um, the cache warming uh, first. So replication. We have two regions here. We actually operate out of three. So this goes between like every pair. Uh, but I'll just show you these two. We have an app in region A and an app in region B. And we have a cache in region A that we want to match the cache in region B. So in A, an app could mutate that cache and asynchronously send metadata about that mutation into Kafka. We have an app we call our replication relay. It pulls that data out of Kafka and can optionally pull the data if it needs it out of the cache and write it across the cross-region link to what we call a replication proxy, which does that operation on behalf of the app in region A in the cache in region B. And then the app in region B can see that change. And of course, this goes both directions or every which way between all different regions. The cache warming, this is our steady state. So you've seen this before um, without the Kafka. But in, this, in our steady state, we're writing to one cache. Say we want to double it. It's two nodes right now. We want four. 
Well, we can bring up a second one in parallel that's double the size and start writing to it immediately. We bring up a cache warming app that pulls that metadata stream from Kafka, can read the data from the old one and write it into the new one until the new one looks like the old one. And then we can tear down the cache warmer, tear down the old one, well, send reads to the new one first, then tear down the old one, and we're in our new steady state. And very recent modifications or updates to memcached itself have actually made it possible for us to do this uh, without the Kafka box on here. Um, but we're still figuring out how to roll that out into production. This is all the code that our clients need to use in order to actually take advantage of all of that complexity that I've just shown you. All they need to do is make a client, set, get, delete, touch, et cetera, anything that you might think to do on a memcached server. That's all our clients need to do internally. So let's switch gears a little bit. I've been working, well, I've been showing you all of this higher level design work, how the caches operate in the larger environment. Let's take a deeper dive into the server side. So this is a new server for us. We've just, well, we're at the tail end of rolling this out to the places that it's required. It's a project we call Moneta. His name Moneta, after the goddess of memory and the protectress of funds for Juno. It's an evolution of our server to put some data on disk. It's a cost optimization project for us. And it's lowering our cost now, but also lowering the rate of increase of our cost in the future as we gain more members. This is pretty important for us because we actually track the cost per stream start. It's a metric that our finance team tracks. And something that is highly correlated, if we change that, will be helpful in the future. And it takes advantage of our global request patterns that we have across multiple different regions. So our old server you've already seen is just memcached and Prana. It's not very exciting. All the data is stored in RAM. This is very expensive, relatively speaking, compared to disk. The late last year, Netflix as a company changed their architecture, they changed our architecture, to be N plus one across three different regions, meaning that any one region could go down at any time and we would be okay by shifting traffic to the other two. Any member can be served equally well from any region. In addition, at the beginning of this calendar year, we launched in 130 new countries at the same time, which just added more data onto the pile. So how do we optimize this? Well, we can target those personalization pre-compute use cases that you saw before. Our global data means many copies. So that picture that you saw with three copies is actually nine globally, because it's three in one region, three in each region times three regions, you have nine copies. But our, our access patterns are very heavily region-oriented. If you're watching Netflix in California, you are hitting the US West 2 region. The likelihood that we see your traffic go to EU West 1 or, or US East 1, the other two regions that we operate out of, is extremely low. So in one region, our hot data is very hot, and our cold data is very cold. We'll keep the hot data in RAM and the cold data on disk. And we can size the RAM for the working set and size the SSD for the whole data set. What does our new server look like? It adds a couple new processes. There's one called rend and another called mnemonic. We're still running memcached. The server now is a dynamic L1, L2 cache, which allows it to adapt to the needs of the application at any time without worrying about very strictly uh, segregating data. And all three of these processes are running the same protocol, so we can use the same debugging tools or same load generation tools to test any one of them. So rend here is the proxy taking external connections and holding open connections to the internal processes, memcached and mnemonic, our L1 and L2. We'll take a look at rend first, take a look at mnemonic, see the whole thing together, and we'll take a look at some performance numbers, which is probably the most exciting part for me. So any Go developers in the audience? Yes, OK. This is a Go project. You can go get it. It's actually a public. GitHub repo under the Netflix org. Um, so yeah, have fun with that. 
It's a high-performance, wire-compatible memcached proxy and server. It's a transparent change to our clients. It's written in Go, mostly for its concurrency primitives, but also because it's relatively fast for developers to get up and running and to write new code, and it's very fast when it's running in production. Its purpose is to manage the L1 and L2 relationship on a single box. And before the project even started, we had caches that had tens of thousands of concurrent connections reading and writing. That was a requirement for this process from the very beginning. So taking a better look at the insides of it, it's a modular software project. Um, what you see on GitHub is actually what we're running in production. It's not fake. Uh, it manages the connections coming in, the request orchestration between L1 and L2, uh, communicating to the back ends. It even includes our own homegrown metrics library, which might make some of you cringe. Um, but nothing really fit our needs in the Go world uh, because we have to integrate with our Atlas backend in Netflix. It includes multiple orchestrators, um, reasons for which will become apparent when we look at the whole thing together. And it includes this feature which we call parallel locking. So any one server can have many parallel requests happening at the exact same time, but no one key will have two concurrent modifications which allows us to keep data integrity and keep L1 and L2 consistent. So mnemonic, this is our L2 piece. I say open source soon with air quotes because I don't really have a timeline for you. Um, but I want to get it open source. We'll see. This is our SSD-backed storage solution. It reuses some of the REN code to do the heavy lifting for memcached protocol parsing and connection management. But its main purpose is to map those memcached operations into RocksDB operations. So in the bottom, you can see RocksDB. The request here would come in on top of this diagram, run through the code that you've already seen in Ren, and through a shim to get into the C++ world, into our mnemonic core library, which then uses the RocksDB library underneath to store the data on disk. We chose RocksDB for a few different reasons, um, mostly because when you write to RocksDB, it writes directly into an in-memory buffer, which then is asynchronously flushed onto disk in these static files. So it's fast to write and fast to read. So how do we use it specifically? Uh, we use FIFO compaction, which isn't really compacting anything at all. It's just this FIFO queue of files on disk. It's linearly uh, written in terms of time, so more recent files coming at the front of the queue and older files will just get deleted at the end. We pin the Bloom filters and indices in memory for quick access or misses, as the case may be, um, which does trade some L1 space, but it makes our L2 much faster, which is great for us. And we have many RocksDB, se like separate RocksDB instances per box so that we can further decrease the latency. This is great for our pre-compute use cases, but we're still working on figuring out how to do this for much uh, for more heterogeneous data. So if we have very fast moving data next to very slow, very fast changing data next to very slow changing data, the fast changing data can write enough data on disk to actually push the slow ones off the end of the FIFO queue, and then we've lost something, which is not great. So we're working on this still. The whole thing together is a little bit more complex. We run multiple different open ports in production for different use cases per server. So we have these servers already serving all of that personalization data before. Remember that pipeline of personalization, all of those green uh, EV cache nodes were this server. We have two ports, one for standard access, which is uh, highly dynamic access or actively managed data. And then we have an async batch port um, well, it's really a batch port. It's not async, but it's for people who are writing data in that won't necessarily be used anytime soon. And it'll keep the working set hot so that we don't end up blowing away our L1 when we're computing our uh, personalization stuff. OK, the slide I've been waiting for. Um, so this is performance in production for our most heavily loaded cache that is using Moneta right now. Um, I measured both at the peak, like the three hours of peak for us and the three hours in the trough for us, uh, all the different latencies and percentiles and things. So um, given all the complexity that we've added to this, 
you might think that it's really slow. But um, taking a look at the gets, our average latency is around 230 microseconds on the server side. And you can see the percentiles here. The higher ones get a little high because it's go, uh, go is a garbage collected language, but that's OK with us. Um, the 99th is really, really great for us. And in the trough, it's even faster. And the sets are also, we're very happy with this, 367 microseconds average. Um, and like I said, you can see the rest of the percentiles there. But these are all great for us. So if we look at client-side latencies, the network in AWS adds maybe 250 to 500 microseconds. And most people expect an answer out of us in under a millisecond almost all the time. OK, I told you this is a cost optimization project. Any guesses? Highest percentage savings we saw in a single cluster? 1,000%. 1, 1,000%. Kind of <laughs> impossible. 10%. <laughs> a little low. OK, it's about 70% cost savings on a single cluster, just because we noticed that we have this small hot set and a really large cold data set. And this project has been a really great one for us. Uh, and we're just nearing the end of rolling it out. Um, so yeah, huge success for us. All these things that you've seen, not all of them, sorry, mnemonic had the air quotes around it. Um, EVCache, the Java client library, is open source. And that uh, REST API that I mentioned earlier is also in that same repository. And the REND code itself is also open source on the Netflix uh, GitHub repo. So you can go check those out. And that's all I have. OK, I'll take any questions if anybody wants. Yes. Uh, I wasn't the engineer that, sorry, the question was the decision tree to get to RocksDB. Um, I wasn't the engineer who made the decision specifically to go with RocksDB. Um, but generally, it was the fastest. It worked for our use case. Uh, yeah, I have to think about it a little bit more. You can, I'll be at the booth after this for a couple hours, so please come find me. Yes. All right, have we considered using Couchbase? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, we've talked to them before. Uh, we're happy with our homegrown solution. It's working really well for us. If we need to customize it in any way, we can just turn around and modify our code and get a new candidate jar out that same day. Um, I don't believe that would be a good process for Couchbase. So, um, I mean, I haven't like gone into deep talks with them, but uh, we're happy with where we are. Um, and I don't think that we would have been able to do something like uh, the Moneta project directly with them. Yes? Have you found any limitations with the operations that are provided by MinCacheD that if you weren't doing like protocols for MinCacheD, you would be able to implement? Uh, Right, so have we found any limitations with the commands that are available in the memcached protocol? Um, not really. A lot of our data is organized by user or profile or something like that. Uh, most of the time, people just want to get the whole piece of data. There's not very many use cases where they just want like the one array element. Um, so it's not really necessary. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, time scale for this project. You mean the Mineta project, right? Yes. Uh, the time scale. I started dabbling in Go about a year ago, and started hacking on Rend uh, maybe November ish. Uh, I had convinced my teammates earlier this year that it was a good idea to do this project um, in this manner. And we are basically done rolling it out into production for the largest use cases right now. 
So about a year total. Yeah, follow up. So how did I convince my teammates to, to use Go? Kind of like, because we're not in the paved path anymore. Um, it's not too hard when you make a proof of concept that's already running fast right off the bat. So that's what I said, like it's fast when it's compiled. I had a, a relatively dumb like text protocol based version that was already running you know, in the hundreds of thousands of RPS fairly easily. So um, from there, we don't, we don't even run that fast uh, on any one server. Uh, from there, we can work out how to make it function on the server. We already had memcached, which was essentially a binary blob to us. We already were kind of off the paved path, so it didn't really scare us so much. Um, plus, my teammates have um, been converted, I guess, to the religion of Go at this point. Um, they seem to like the language. Is there any other questions? Anybody up top have anything? Yeah. yeah. Was the uh, was the cost saving uh, process driven top down by management, or is that just something you came up with for the team and decided to go after? Okay. Did the management ask us to do this to save money? Um, not directly. Engineers at Netflix tend to have a lot of context about how the business is doing and where it's going and what the needs are. So as a team, we've looked at what our needs were and saw this opportunity for an optimization. So we decided to just go for it. Um, and you know, not only do we have to convince ourselves that this is a good idea, we have to go to all these people whose data we're storing uh, and tell them, hey, we're going to change this out from under you. I hope you're OK with that. And uh, they generally are. So uh, it was driven mostly by the engineers, but we had backup as we were pitching this idea. Started as a side project, became my main project, just because we decided it was a higher priority. Anything else? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up, please? OK, um, I probably didn't explain that extremely well. This is the first time I've presented that slide publicly. Uh, so our personalization project uh, process ends up creating an, an ad hoc data dependency DAG, but it's not any formalized like DAG that exists anywhere in any form other than an engineer's minds of, this is my dependency. Uh, so when they're writing the data out, their process um, writes into an EVCache cluster. And those EVCache clusters are um, in discovery, um, in, in the service discovery system. And anybody can find them at any time. So that's, I'm not sure if I answered your question. It uses Eureka, right? uh, yeah, so anybody who wants to talk to EVCache would use the Eureka system in order to, to access them. Does, does that answer your question? Well, in that, in that diagram, there was these like single green like database-looking things. That was meant to represent a whole cluster, and that's actually a globally replicated sharded cluster. I saw another, yes. Any plans to extend to other cloud providers? Uh, it's open source. <laughs> we accept patches, <laughs> pull requests. Um, not really. We, our team is focused on solving Netflix problems. Um, we have it in open source in the hopes that it helps other people solve their problems. 
it's not a primary goal for us to support the open source like, as an open source thing, like, um, but uh, it should be useful to some people. Anything else? Up top? Nothing? Okay. I think that's it.